Hi everyone, welcome to Junk It, the show where I talk with filmmakers about their work. Today I have special guest John Hyams on to discuss his Universal Soldier films. Universal Soldier was a franchise that had been laying dormant for about 10 years or so after its second installment in 1999, and it wasn't until 2009 that John Hyams brought the franchise back to life with uh, Universal Soldier Regeneration and then subsequently Universal Soldier Day of Reckoning. Both of his installments are quite idiosyncratic approaches to the action genre, but Day of Reckoning especially does something pretty unprecedented for a fourth installment of an action franchise. It, it, it sort of dismantles everything you know about the series and takes it into more of a borderline body horror territory. I say it in the interview, but I think a comparison between Day of Reckoning and Twin Peaks Season 3 can be made in terms of the way that it brings back beloved, iconic characters, but now they're older and a little more tertiary to the plot and acting more as a symbol of what they once represented. I'll also say, I think it's really interesting speaking with a director you admire and watching as they kind of affirm everything that you feel about their work. I felt like everything I thought about Day of Reckoning was confirmed through John's thoughtful articulation of his intentions making the film. The audio in the first section of this interview got a little messed up. I think it's okay. It's listenable. I'm not a podcast expert. Uh, but aside from that, uh, enjoy this conversation with John Hyams about Universal Soldier. So hi, John. Thank you so much for doing this. The first question I have is... What was your entry point into cinema? I, I believe you made your first film in 1997. I'm curious uh, how you got into this as a career. Yeah, you know, I while I did actually technically make my first film in 97, I actually had been pursuing a career in fine arts, had, had studied that and had invested, uh, you know, many years in that and worked in uh both as you know, a painter and a sculptor, also worked for a number of other artists as a fabricator for for a good ten years or so after college, even. Um, so that during that time, while I was still uh, pursuing that career, I did kind of self finance. Uh, you know, I loved movies always. Of course, I grew up with it because of my dad and grew up on sets and had a lot of jobs working on sets. So I always loved cinema and and was as more influenced by that than anything. And always kind of imagined that I would make my way to it, but the thing I was best at was, was drawing and painting and sculpture. And like I said, I invested a lot of time into that. So um, I had moved to New York city after college, after graduating and had, a, was there with a lot of friends and a lot of creative people. And uh, so as a, as a way of just doing a project with everyone, we, we all started kind of making what, started out maybe as a short film and just kind of grew over time, 16 millimeter, you know, black and white movie um, that was in very, very much kind of influenced by what I was seeing in, in movies at the time. Um, you know, you could almost see its direct uh, influences in what Linklater was doing with Slacker uh, also what Jarmusch had been doing in Stranger Than Paradise and Down by Law and all those movies. So those are the movies, uh, among many others that I love, but those are the ones that I was immediately seeing. And I think trying my hand and trying just to do something with friends with no real eye towards it really being a uh, career endeavor. It was just a, an outside creative endeavor that ended up then becoming all consuming, of course. And I spent all my money on it and went into, you know, debt and did the whole thing that everyone does and ended up spending, having to drop everything and spend three years trying just to complete this thing. And uh, by the time I got to the end of it, again, I returned back to fabrication and still did that for a number of more years. Um, 
that movie that we made, which was called One Dog Day, again, just a movie that made with a bunch of friends. It showed at a couple festivals and didn't do all that much more than that. But at this point in time, now I started writing screenplays and getting more involved with pursuing it. And, and, and then it reached a certain point where I had to make a decision to uh, either, you know, choose one career or the other. I decided to go all in on, on film. And at that point, my entry point then became a uh, document. Once I had fully committed to it was through, uh, through making documentaries kind of around year 2000 ish. So yeah, it's interesting that you bring up Linklater and Jarmusch because your films now are quite violent and and bloody. And I'm I'm curious what draws you to um, action and 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 blood in film. Well, I think that the the funny thing is that when I was a young kid and my brother and I used to make Super Eight movies together that he would be the director of and I would be, you know, one of the actors. Um, and I use that term very loosely, but we, uh, those were all basically exercises in action. You know, we were always, it was always a foot chase or a fight. And we seemed really obsessed with trying to, you know, recreate these action set pieces. And I think that is, you know, probably really obviously just directly related to uh, what our dad was doing because he was making movies that had these really impressive, inventive action set pieces. And I think we started to see just that aspect of the craft of filmmaking. Um, and in many ways, it was less, I think at that time, about violence as an actual, you know, literal subject and more about the pursuit of recreating something realistically. Um, and action is, is the most kind of chaotic event you can imagine. So it's kind of controlling this chaos and realistically representing it and experientially depicting it so that the audience is having a subjective experience. This is something that we saw our dad doing. So the funny thing is, if you look at that movie that I made, that was in theory trying to be like Jarmusch or Linklater, the things that were most notable about it were some action sequences that played out in it. And which were very much like the things we used to do as kids um, and then once I looked back on it, and if I really actually stopped and thought about it, I realized that the movies that we loved so much as kids, um, everything from Carpenter to Ridley Scott to Coppola to Taxi Driver to Clockwork Orange, you know, almost all these movies involved some level of 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 genre elements that were then expressed in in ways that were you know beautiful and works of art but but they all kind of had their roots you know i mean i think the ultimate movie the one that that really made us all i think think about wanting to make movies at the time was was alien you know and and after alien soon following that you know my dad made outland and uh one that we were really present for the entire shoot of that this kind of blend of like hard r-rated violence with science fiction and world building and and kind of encompassing and using all every element of of filmmaking as an art form and and celebrating all these elements in terms of scope and spectacle but also you know being very uh you know 
you know, subjectively very intense. Um, I think that's the stuff that really moved us. And I say us, I mean, I say me and my brother, my older brother, you know, that, that was who I was watching these movies with. So if I look at the, the things that I do, which somehow I, you know, I, I didn't even intentionally uh, go this way, but it's sort of where I naturally ended up. And I think it, 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 it makes a lot of sense if I look back on it now. It does make sense because I think for me personally, watching kind of, you know, action, violent films as a kid, it's you kind of recognize with your wise mind that there's a lot of love that goes into it. And it's actually portraying chaos on screen is kind of like an act of love in a strange way to me. Yeah, I think I, 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 I like the way you put that. And I think. I think you're right too. In the in and in the sense, it's like I was, you know, not like a violent kid or anything, and I'm not a violent person. Um, and in many ways, I think as a filmmaker, you're always trying to uh, trying to depict the things that that maybe give you anxiety, the things that frighten you. So the idea of kind of of violence like that is something that as a kid that probably used to keep me up at night. Um, so in some ways it's, it's, I guess it's your way of, 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 of wrapping your, wrapping your hands around something that, that you can't control. And, and, and in doing that, just the act of trying to depict these things, you're, you're somehow gaining some level of control over it, I guess. I mean, that's really that I'm sort of psychoanalyzing myself, which i I'm not doing what I'm actually making the movies, but if I think about it now, you know, you like to depict the things that, that scare you, you know, it's a way of, it's a way of, uh, of, it's like a, a way of, um, of, uh, keeping the evil spirits at bay, maybe, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I mean, so then judging by day of reckoning, I mean, I feel like the fear there is, is, helplessness and not knowing oneself and um searching for something that you can't quite understand in the moment um it's it's a very scary movie to me yeah i think to me too it certainly was it was always intended to be um using action as horror again um i've seen many movies really successfully portray action in a way that is um, purely fun. And I've enjoyed so many of those movies. Um, but for me, I guess that's ne never been my approach to action. While I, I want it to be visceral and I want it to be exciting and cathartic for the audience, but I, I always, and especially, you know, Day of Reckoning being a very clear example of it. it it was always intended to be something that was kind of scary and something that as the audience you were you were hoping to avoid you know that that the the action and the violence would have uh great and kind of shocking impact and uh and i think in that movie at that point in time i was I think I was trying to just um, really make something that that put you through a an intense psychological and and physical experience as an audience member, and so we decided to tell this story and make it be about a character who is. Um, you know, in an amnesia story. So you're, you're, you're sort of following through the eyes of, uh, of a character who doesn't know what's going on. And that as an audience, we only know as much as our, as our protagonist. And as things, as he discovers things and, you know, we become more and more clear of what is going on. And that by the end of it, we've sort of realized that we're involved in this, paranoid thriller where 
our 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 protagonist has been um thinks he's been acting on his own free will but in fact he's been essentially um let you know playing out the uh playing out the 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 wishes and orders of others and you know it, it just kind of got to the root of something that i thought was a really fascinating interesting idea which is just an existential concept of you know are we are we in control of our of our actions is there is free will an illusion or something that we are you know we just are convincing ourselves of and and so i think and I, and I think that that's really goes back to a lot of the movies that I loved. And, the, you know, I, I stepped into the Universal Soldier franchise. It, it, it kind of found me more than I found it. And once I was a part of it and this was my opportunity, then I tried to turn the mythology of it towards things, towards those kind of Philip K. Dick concepts that I that were things that excited me. Yeah, I mean, because the 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 film you had done prior to Day of Reckoning, the Universal Soldier film, is I I would think a, a little more traditionally an action film that kind of gestures towards something a little more sinister and a little different than what the series had been doing. Um, but then Day of Reckoning just kind of like it almost like dismantles what you know about the series. And um, I don't know if you've seen Twin Peaks season three, but um, what that does is kind of take the iconic actors that you know and love, and now they're older and they're a little more tertiary and off to the side. And and they, they're, they, they're kind of playing a, a an idea or a symbol of what they once were. So I'm curious kind of in the creative process how you conceptualized this almost dismantling of, of the series yeah um i think regeneration i was brought in there was an existing script so there was a sort of framework that i had to adhere to while i was still able to guide it in a in a direction that that excited me so i think story wise and tonally that one started out as one thing you know it started much more firmly rooted in the idea of there's a there's a problem out there you know there's this external problem involving kind of international terrorism and kidnapping and prime ministers and things like that and somehow now they got to bring in the universal soldiers like they're the dirty dozen and they're going to come solve this problem and for me i felt at that time i questioned um how relevant first of all the existing you know the 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 franchise was in the in the minds of contemporary film goers i thought in some ways this film should be reintroducing the mythology to the audience. It doesn't mean that it, it should disrespect what was done before, but I don't think we should continue on something that a lot of people, myself included, wasn't I wasn't too clued in on. So I thought let's let's get back to the the Frankenstein myth of this whole thing and that let's treat this uh outside problem if you will the you know the the saving of the prime minister's children who've been abducted by some separatist group that's essentially the macguffin to a story that is about you know creating a slave race of zombie you know soldiers to go fight your wars um and what happens you know when uh they don't have a war to fight well they'll create a war you know so that was kind of the concept um and and i was given enough rope to run with that and then i think based on the studio and everyone feeling satisfied with that one and i guess it was able to financially do for them what whatever it was expected to do or do do more than that that then 
And I also had the trust of the uh, the main actors involved between JC and, and Dolph that because they didn't want to go and just make the same old thing again either. So I think they trusted the idea of let's take this different places. So then when Day of Reckoning came around, <clears throat> they asked me to come up with a concept for it. And we spent a little while on that because the first concept and the first script I wrote like went way too far off the rails, quite frankly, if you if you can imagine that the day of reckoning was actually the, you know, was the compromise. Um, the the first script was almost like in some ways obliterated what if you if you can imagine like a it would be like a sequel to a movie that's happening like 30 years later and the every you know existence has changed like if the end of regeneration was that a genie was let out of the bottle and then it was almost like take it was essentially took place in the future and and showed a world that was the result of all this so um i think they everyone felt I'd skip skipped a few too many steps there. I said, "All right, let's let's do let let's how do I capture the spirit of what I'm going for here?" Um, meaning, let's let's try to let's try to just tell a different kind of story here because again, we, it's not like we were working with massive budgets or anything where we could out scale anything that was out there and that and that's something that i was thinking about was like at the time i think it was like a, you know there wasn't fast and furious but there was like a gi joe right like big pg action movies that are making a lot of money um with lots of visual effects and lots of um gravity defying stunts and uh and i thought well we there's no reason to try to compete with that if we can't even um be in be in that same arena but what's the thing we can do that they can't do well we can make an r-rated movie so i can make uh violence that is impactful it's not going to be as you know large scaled as what's going on there but it can be more intense and, uh, you know, and that's the thing, people, when you talk about Indiana Jones, you don't talk about what a violent movie is. But when you talk about Reservoir Dogs, you talk about what a violent movie is. But like the body count of Indiana Jones is, is, is a lot bigger than the body count of Reservoir Dogs. It's just that those few moments are are so shocking and intense in Reservoir Dogs that they stick with you. So I thought, well, let's let's follow that, you know, model there. Like, you know, think about like, you know, the pistol whipping in Goodfellas is like the most violent thing I've ever seen in a movie. And it just sticks with me forever. And then again, you could take uh, any long list of movies where there are you know, hundreds of people dis dispatched and you don't remember any of it. So I thought, I mean, I just kind of took some, uh, I guess, learned some lessons from those kind of things saying, hey, if this is a movie about violence, which when you get down to it, it is the Universal Soldier franchise is all about just creating war machines. So I thought, let's, what is that really all about? And then what would it feel like to be inside the skin of one of these you know and that was that was the real concept of telling a monster movie from the perspective of the monster so you know all these different ways you know all these different concepts were were i guess reverse engineered at first by what do we have you know budget wise what's what what exactly do we have to work with here and then let the idea come out of that and and that's I've basically done that ever since because I always feel like um, I'm really comfortable working in all kinds of budgets. I think you just have to find whatever whatever your budget is, then you have to decide, okay, 
what's the movie that makes this the appropriate budget? And, uh, and so that is, that's always a part of it. And that that's kind of some of those movies, you know, began with that. And there was other elements that came into it as well in terms of how do we, how do we use Jean-Claude and Dolph in a way that's interesting? You know, we, they've gone through so many permutations, these characters in these movies. What if we, what, what if instead of having them be the protagonists, what if they're sort of the, the idea that hangs over the whole story and you bring in a new protagonist because I couldn't tell this story from the monster perspective, especially an unknowing monster, unless I, introduce someone new to the table. So that's where, that's where Scott Atkins came in. You're, you're kind of confirming and uh, confirming everything that I, I have thought about this movie, which is really cool. I, um, I think just in terms of the violence and um, the main character, uh, Scott Atkins plays. Um, I've sort of seen very few movies where the lead is so strong and yet is contending and almost horrified with his own strength and his fingers growing back. And it feels like at the end, he keeps his daughter's memory that's fabricated in order to like have some shred of humanity. And it's really, it's really unsettling. It's haunted me for quite a while. Oh, I mean, I'm, uh, I'm glad that it, that it, that it was, that uh, it was memorable for you. Um, yeah, I loved, at a certain point, I arrived upon this idea of um, what if, uh, you know, if you, you know, the idea of like false memories being implanted, I mean, that's been done before and that's, you know, Blade Runner, Rachel and Blade Runner and all those things. So in thinking of that, then, I started thinking about, well, what if, you know, what if you're the best way to motivate someone to do your bidding in, in this, in like the Manchurian candidate sense, if you're trying to create like sleeper assassins to, to go carry out the government's work. Well, the, the best way to do that is, is to give them you know, to motivate them uh, emotionally. So we came up with, you know, this concept of what if, uh, uh, you know, a protagonist, what if you basically are making a revenge story where a protagonist loses his family in the opening scene in horrific fashion, the rest of the movie, and this is kind of the construct of all revenge movies, is that we show you something horrible, like in Death Wish, and now the rest of the movie it gives this protagonist license to brutalize everybody. And we actually, it's cathartic to watch him do that because we're so traumatized by what we saw early in the movie. And I thought, wouldn't it be great because that's, it is such a manipulative concept and it's one that works, but wouldn't it be great if at a certain point the protagonist learns, oh, that's all, none of those things actually happened and uh his family that he that were killed were never never existed at all well like you say now then all of his humanity is gone so he can either choose to live in a world where he had no family um or what would be more likely is that you would decide well, that family is every bit as real to him as as anyone's memory is to them. So regardless of all that, he's going to now choose to live in the world where they exist and he's going to continue to seek revenge because, um, and that was that kind of last line of the movie, which, you know, was what the whole thing was about as he says, you know, he's got the, the, uh, the, the Gorman character, and he says, uh, you know, um, something to the effect of you killed my family. And he says, I didn't kill your family. Luke Devereaux did. And he says, yeah, but you put him up to it, you know? And uh, I thought that that was like the idea of setting that moment up meant that 
this guy was never going to stop tr- continuing out this revenge uh, tear that he was on. So whoever put this guy up, because this guy was clearly like middle management. So who's the next on the ladder and then the next and then the next, and that there'd be no end to his. And he's obviously got now building an army. So by the end, you know, you imagine that the, you know, which all goes back to the, uh, the Frankenstein myth of, uh, you know, don't mess around with that stuff. It might come back to bite you in the ass. From a production standpoint, I, when I found out that this was shot in 3D, I refused to watch it until I could watch it in 3D. And I have a little setup where I can do that. So I ordered a Blu-ray from Turkey in order to be able to watch it in 3D, actually. And it was so, like, I know everything was shot in 3D in, like, 2011, but this actually feels so intentional, and it adds this really strange effect to the film that, especially in the flickering moments and in the POV moments and the close-ups of faces, it's chilling. So I'm curious uh what why did you choose to shoot it in 3d and what was your experience with that well the the funny thing is i didn't choose to shoot it in 3d i like resisted it with everything i had and the and the financiers when we first made the deal they said you have the choice you can do it in 3d or 2d but at least investigate it and so i investigated it and everything I learned told me that we didn't have the budget or the means to, you know, in any way to do this in 3D and that it was just going to be a frustrating exercise and cumbersome and limit the way we could shoot it. So I said, okay, I've decided to do it in 2D. And they said, well, too late. We sold it as 3D. So you're either you're either uh, in or you're out. And I think at the time I said, okay, I'm out. And then, uh, and then came crawling back and said, okay, fine. But I get to choose, you know, the DP or something like that. So really I had no choice. Um, but once given the choice, uh, Yaron Levy, who was, that was the first film I made with him. And we've now done a lot of things together, but that was the beginning of our working relationship. And I think what we said to each other we you know he, his he resisted 3d as much as i did but i think we then realized well if we're doing this in 3d even though most the vast majority of people will never see this in 3d we somehow decided uh we have to make this work in 3d and we have to shoot it completely with 3d in mind and follow a bunch of the kind of visual and spatial rules that 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 3d requires if it's to work and it's certain things like you know long lenses kind of don't really make sense in 3d because long lenses compress everything so it ends up makes everything look like a pop-up book so we decided we won't shoot with a lens any longer than a 40 millimeter lens and you know, he- lots of quick cutting doesn't really serve 3D as much either. You kind of need a little bit of longer takes to feel yourself moving through a space. And um, and the funny thing was, once we started kind of going down this, and, and there was another thing was that 3D, you're never going to get nearly as many setups as you want. You know, you might, it, it, what everything we learned was that you can't expect to get any more than 12 setups in a day. And so we thought, all right, well, then we're going to design this movie that, so that we can do it every day in 12 setups. And what we came to find and what I certainly came to find was that that's actually all of these like um, restrictions that 3D created um, actually just um, kind of all all led me down a road towards a type of filmmaking that I actually prefer to do, you know, in that I prefer a much more single camera approach and I prefer to 
create, you know, geography so that the the audience knows where they are. I, I, I kind of shy away from super long lenses, even though I know that they can be beautiful. Sometimes they don't give you the geography that you want. And, and I like the camera playing out and not being impatient with cutting. So the funny thing was, but, you know, through this, this whole external thing that was forced on us, that was really like, uh, the last thing in the world you want to do when you're working in a tighter budget, it ended up, um, leading me down a road that I've only gone further down. I haven't gone back to 3D, but I think I've, uh, it, it, in many ways, it kind of led me to a type of filmmaking that I was far more interested in, in doing. And I think it reinforced a lot of good habits because you had to be much more, um, not just minimalistic, but you had to just put the camera where it really needed to be and hold a shot as long as you should hold it and, you know, let things develop in a shot and uh, reveal things in shots. And, and so it, it, it kind of led me down uh, a road of more disciplined storytelling that, that, uh, that I'm actually, you know, grateful to have had that experience. I think it forced us to be more disciplined. That's fascinating because I, I think the end product just it really adds something. I can't say that about many 3D movies. Um, oh, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. I have one more question. I really like to ask directors this because I think everybody has a very different answer. But um, what what kind of director are you on set? Uh, what's your work ethic? How do you work with actors? I'm, I'm very curious. Uh, filming something is such a long and arduous process and I'm curious kind of how you conduct yourself you know I I try to um I try to be very prepared um and and when I say be prepared make sure that all, all the department heads and collaborators that everyone feels very prepared and that everyone has a really clear idea of the movie that we're making. Um, because when I'm on set, I, I like to be, you know, a very quiet voice on set. I, I'd like to create a feeling where everyone there knows exactly what we're doing. And I can really just um, have a very gentle approach to every, to everyone so that, every actor feels like they know their character better than I do. And every, every department head feels like they know how, you know, their, their set should look even better than I do. And if everyone feels like they know exactly what they're doing and that they don't need to go to me for every answer, then when you get on set, there's already things are moving and in motion and the camera knows where it needs to go and the actors know what they're supposed to do. And like I say, I can have a very um, gentle approach to, um, to, you know, in, on my end, I want, I want everyone to be, it's a, the, the beauty of, of filmmaking is that it's incredibly collaborative and, the more I do it, the more I lean on my collaborators, because the more you start working with incredible people and in that you realize that your own ideas only take you so far. You know, as a director, I think my job is essentially to apply my taste and my aesthetic ideas um, to hundreds of thousands of decisions that are going to be made. But uh but it doesn't mean that every good idea is going to come from me. And in fact, that you know, my job is really to curate the ideas and, and it's to start out with something and now it's going to evolve and grow from that. And it's through, so my key decisions are, are the, the people I, that I hire, the people I want to work with. And by the time I've assembled my team and assembled the cast, well, it's already way better than whatever I started out with. And my, my goal and my hope is that everyone is always going to improve on these ideas. And, you know, I can just, 
if nobody has an idea, I always have one, but I'm always hoping someone has a better one and that we're improving it and that whatever the idea was that I had in my head going into this, I I am embracing the fact that that is going to change and it's going to, it's going to evolve and it's going to take its own form. And at a certain point, the movie starts dictating sometime during shooting and then all through post, it sort of starts dictating the decisions. You're no longer trying to execute, at least I'm not, the vision I had before. I'm trying to figure out what this thing is now and 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 be open enough to answer to it. And uh, so that's the fun of the process for me. So I think, I mean, if you ask other people, you know, they would give you the answer, but but I but I would assume they'd say that I'm that I try to be a, a calming presence on set and be, you know, help everybody relax, you know, so that and even if we're in a big rush, and even if the sun is setting, and even if something didn't work, I try to just absorb the stress of the situation so it doesn't so I don't put it on the people around me so that they feel really free to create and and without that kind of pressure. Um that so that's what I I think that's the way I like to do it is is to make it be a, a really enjoyable environment for everyone there and for the actors to feel like they're free to experiment and try things and not afraid to fail, you know. So I think I would I think that's what my approach is. So that was a really fun one. I, I hope you enjoyed that. I, I definitely enjoyed speaking to John. Many more really exciting guests to come on Junket. So if you want to keep up, you can follow at JunketPod on Twitter or myself at, at Evian.official on Instagram. Thank you so much for listening and I'll see you on the next episode.